I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Okay, we're live. Hopefully everyone can see us and hear us. Thank you everyone for joining. This is uh, Daniel Hayraju. Uh, welcome to the channel. Today we have a debate, informal debate, between myself and Mark Collette, a prominent white nationalist in the UK. Thanks for joining us, Mark. This is- well, thank you for inviting me on. Yes, uh, this is an informal debate, meaning we'll give each other uh, opening statements and then we'll have just an open discussion and hopefully at the end we can have time to address questions from the live chat. Um, we're going to be broadly discussing white nationalism and how it's affected, um, how it affects and is affected by Muslims on the social, political and cultural um, levels. So, uh, if Mark, you want to give your opening statement. Okay, I will do that. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. Before I do my opening statement, I am no longer on YouTube. I have been censored from this platform. Everything that I ever produced on this platform has been deleted, even though some of those videos had in excess of a million views. Because of that, you can only find me on BitChute, Odyssey, Gab, and Telegram. Those are the social networks I am active on. If you want to follow me on those social networks, that would be great. I am now on a special list of people who are banned from all mainstream social networks for life. So you won't find me in any of the usual places because the things I speak about are not illegal. I don't break the law. I don't use racial slurs. I don't insult people. But despite all of that, I have been banned because... The kind of things I speak about are things that the establishment don't want people hearing about. So now I'll begin my statement. As an ethno-nationalist, and I am an ethno-nationalist, I believe that all peoples of the world deserve a homeland, and all peoples of the world deserve to be able to pursue self-determination and take their destiny into their own hands. As such, I am wholeheartedly opposed to Western interventions within the Middle East and have vehemently opposed Western military actions in the region. I believe that the aforementioned Western interventions in the Middle East have been largely driven by Zionist interests. The State of Israel wishes to maintain its position as the dominant and unchallenged force in the region by using its power over Amer America and other Western nations in order to ensure that those nations use their military might to attack and destabilize sovereign Islamic republics and nations, not only with the use of brute force, but also with punishing and unfair sanctions and by funding Islamic extremist groups such as the Islamic State who have been used to destabilize nations such as Syria and Iraq. As such, I have much in common with Muslims who wish to see the Middle East left in peace so that Islamic nations can grow and trade as they wish without Zionist influence. What's more, I wish to see my nation freed from that Zionist influence, which wields disproportionate power over many Western institutions. I believe Zionist power is a threat to both Muslims and Europeans. What's more, as an ethno-nationalist, I wholeheartedly oppose the ethnic cleansing that takes place in Israel, whereby Palestinians are regularly and systematically brutalized and driven from their ancestral homeland. What's more, I acknowledge that Zionist power in the West and Jewish influence within the mainstream media have effectively ensured that the Palestinian people suffer in silence and that such suffering is ignored by the vast majority of Western folk. As well as being a nationalist, I'm also a traditionalist. As such, 
I acknowledge that those in the West who hold traditional values close to their hearts have much in common with those Muslims who also place great importance upon traditionalism. As such, I am sure I would agree with many Muslims on the importance of family values, the importance of women as wives, homemakers and mothers, and of course I would agree with traditionalist Muslims when it comes to opposing the LGBT agenda and the sexualization of children. Saying all of that, I have to go back to what I said at the beginning of my opening statement. I am an ethno-nationalist. This means I want my nation, the United Kingdom, to remain largely ethnically homogenous, and as such, I oppose mass immigration. Now, I am well aware that much of the Islamic immigration from the Middle East is a result of Zionist-led foreign policy that the UK and the US have pursued, and the streams of displaced Muslims created by a succession of needless foreign wars are a result of unjust and often illegal bombing campaigns and invasions. However, there is still a sizable portion of Islamic immigration into the UK, which is nothing to do with Western involvement in the Middle East. This migration is encouraged by government policies, policies which are designed to ensure that white Britons are reduced to a minority within their ancestral homelands. I want this to be very clear. Europe is for the Europeans. Whilst I oppose Zionist-led foreign policy and Western military intervention in the Middle East, I do not wish for the UK or Europe to become Islamic. In fact, I quite openly state that I am against any further immigration and that I am also opposed to the Islamification of Western nations. Whilst nationalists and Muslims do indeed have some things in common, we also have many differences. And as a nationalist, it is clear to see that when Western nations experience mass immigration from Islamic nations, that influx of migrants changes not only the demographics of the host nation, but also the culture and character of those nations. What's more, mass immigration from Islamic nations has also led to many horrific social problems, including the widespread rape and abuse of white British girls by men who are overwhelmingly of Pakistani Muslim descent. This crime against our people can never be brushed under the carpet or forgotten. I do not want Western cities filled with mosques. I do not want to hear the wailing from Islamic prayer towers. I do not wish to see the streets of my nation filled with women whose faces are covered with veils. I do not want Sharia courts operating alongside English and Scottish courts. And I don't want to see areas of my country transformed into mini Islamic ethno states where the indigenous people of these islands no longer feel at home. There is a place for all things Islamic, but that place is elsewhere in the world. Ultimately, I wish to see an end to Zionist influence over Western nations, an end to Western interventions in the Middle East, and an end to mass immigration into the West. I would be happy to help Muslims regain control over their ancestral homelands, and I would be happy for Western nations to trade freely and fairly with those Islamic nations. However, part of this agreement has to include the understanding that once Muslims have control over their own lands and are free from Zionist tyranny, the vast majority of Muslims living in the West must leave and return to their ancestral homelands, leaving Europe in the hands of the Europeans. Okay, uh, thank you for that, Mark. Um, I'll also now begin my opening statement. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salatu wassalam ala rasulillah. Let me start off on a conciliatory note. I'm sympathetic to white Europeans and Americans who feel like their community, their heritage is under attack. I can sympathize with your fears that there will be no future for the white race. I can sympathize with all of this because Muslims and whites have a common enemy. And that enemy is this virus, this cancer known as liberal secular modernity. But here is the ironic thing. Who was it that unleashed this virus into the world? Was it the Jews? Was it blacks? What was the complexion of the people who boldly declared the values of freedom, equality, and democracy above all else? It was white Europeans. It was the white race that brought this disease of liberal secular modernity into existence. And rather than own up to it, white nationalists want to scapegoat minorities, Jews, blacks, and lest we forget, the Muslim grooming gangs. Now, this is not going to be some anti-white tirade. Fact of the matter is, I love white people, and that some of the best Muslims, past and present, 
have been white. And furthermore, as a Muslim, I don't believe in collective blame. But if we are going to look at the world through the lens of race, which white nationalists do, then the undeniable truth is it was whites who established this global modernization project and instituted authoritarian repression against anyone who opposes it. So liberal modernism is the gift whites gave to the world. Now for the uninitiated, the problem with liberal secular modernity is that it destroys everything that human beings naturally value in the name of maximizing individual freedom and equality. To be clear, freedom and equality are important values and they're recognized in Islam. But liberalism takes things to the extreme and prioritizes freedom and equality above other significant values. Values like marriage and family, the value of community, the value of God and religion. These are all essential human values that are rooted in human biology, but liberal secular modernity attacks all of these through a step-by-step -step process of social and political reform. I'll give you a simple example. The news last week reported that Italian police found the mummified remains of a 70-year-old woman sitting at a table for more than two years since she had died. For two years, her corpse was draped on a chair, decomposing, and she didn't have a single relative, not a child, not a niece, no one who would check on her and notice her demise. This nightmarish state of utter loneliness is not uncommon. It happens every day. At this very moment, there are untold numbers of rotting corpses draped over chairs in the dark, waiting to be discovered. No, this nightmare is not uncommon, but it is new. It's something only found in contemporary, liberal, secular societies. You won't find this in traditional societies and societies that value marriage and family because in those societies, the elderly are surrounded by their spouses, their children, their families. I believe Mark fully agrees with me that this is a disaster. But what Mark may not fully appreciate is that as long as you cling to these secular values of individual freedom and equality as these jewels atop the crown of supposed Western intellectual and moral superiority, you will not have marriage. You will not have family, community, or God. All you will have is that corpse rotting alone in a chair and getting rid of all the minorities is not going to change that. I want to be crystal clear on why this is necessarily the case because this is the crux of my whole argument. Maintaining marriage, family, community, and religion requires a certain level of lack of freedom and lack of equality. But liberalism aims to maximize individual freedom and equality. This means that liberal secularism is inherently hostile to these basic human institutions. In marriage, for example, you have certain duties towards your spouse, which means you often have to sacrifice your personal desires and ambitions. Marriage also entails inequality because women, due to their biology and the reality of pregnancy, are hypergamous, meaning they prefer to mate with males who are higher status than themselves. So that generates a natural hierarchy between men and women, and that results in a natural inequality. It is an inequality that is inherent to marriage due to biology, and Islam recognizes this and accommodates it in the best way. Liberalism, however, aims to extinguish this inequality through feminist reform, but in extinguishing the inequality also ipso facto extinguishes marriage. This is why we see marriage rates plummeting wherever the virus of liberalism has taken root. But we don't have to get overly philosophical about it. Many of you watching this, just look at your own life. Do you know why you're alone? Why you don't have a wife? Or if you do have a wife, why you're married, that she's on Instagram right now talking to her secret boyfriend and your marriage will be destroyed by divorce and she's going to take your children and all your assets? All of that is because of liberalism. Similarly, maintaining a family requires limitations on freedom and equality because you have duties to your parents, to your family members. Families also require hierarchy, so that entails inequality. But liberalism aims to gradually, over time, over generations, destroy these inequalities. All members of the family must have equal status and equal authority, even children. 
As an example, consider how every few months on mainstream media, you see articles asking, do parents have the right to teach their children religion or determine their children's education? Do parents have the right to decide their child's gender? The liberal concern here is that this kind of parental authority is an illegitimate violation of equality that infringes upon the autonomy of children. Therefore, parental authority must be abolished. Or as a more immediate example, as a father, do you have the right to tell your teenage daughter not to fornicate with every other boy in school? According to modern parenting, no. How dare the father try to infringe on his daughter's right to sexual expression? Now, hopefully, Mark, you see how all this is destroying family. But the vast majority of white people aren't like you, Mark. The vast majority of white people are pro-liberty, pro-freedom modernists who find the idea of parental authority and discipline as relics of a more intolerant, myopic past. Again, think about your own life. If you're depressed because your children do not respect you, or you're alienated from your parents, or you're worried about being put in a nursing home, these are all due to the liberal destruction of the family. Now, let me preach to the choir for a bit and talk about this other natural tendency of human beings, which is to come together into communities, whether they be, they be religious communities, racial or otherwise. Preserving a community also requires certain types of inequality, lack of freedom, even violence, because there are in-groups and out-groups. But the liberal mind is repulsed by that. I don't need to tell a white nationalist all this because white nationalists understand that preserving whiteness requires shutting down immigration, stopping race mixing, imposing a national identity. And these are the same measures that all nationalists take when they have power, whether they be Chinese communists, Hindu Dva, or Zionism. But liberalism is opposed to these measures precisely because they infringe on freedom and equality. And this is why liberal modernity strives for the kind of globalization that has resulted in the erosion of all communities and heritages, not just whites. Finally, humans are naturally religious in that they're born with belief in God and the afterlife. This is established in numerous psychological studies. But commitment to religion also requires loss of personal freedom and inequality, which and equality, which makes it target number one for the liberal secular project. And of course, the near complete extinction of Christianity in Europe and its rapid decline in the rest of the world at the hands of liberalism is more than enough proof of this. I realize that many white nationalists will join Muslims in bemoaning the destruction of marriage, family, community, and religion, but do they recognize the source of the problem? Many clearly do not. How many white nationalists are proud of figures like the American Founding Fathers? How many are proud of the American Revolution, the French Revolution, the sacred principles of democracy and the Constitution, things like the Industrial Revolution and technological and scientific progress? These were the seeds of the Enlightenment that set the world on the path that has led to our current dystopia. But I have a message for white nationalists. You think things are bad now in 2022, just you wait. As a Muslim, I can tell you your future because every horror that the secular state wants to impose on you, it's already imposed on Muslims. This is the 200 year of colonialism, 200 year history of colonialism and neo-colonialism. Your enlightened white ancestors came to the Muslim world at the beginning of the 19th century and brutally enforced liberal secular modernity. As a result, dozens of indigenous populations were wiped out and those who survived have been subjected to secularization and liberali liberalization, which means that Muslims are being genocided. You want to complain about population replacement and how when you wake up, your neighbors aren't white and your grandchildren aren't white? How do you think Muslims feel when they wake up in Muslim countries and their neighbors are no longer Muslim? Their children are no longer Muslim. White nationalists want to talk about appropriation and how your universities, your schools, your mass media, your churches have in recent history been taken over by anti-white ideologues. How do you think Muslims feel, given the fact that their universities, their madrasas, their national media networks, and even their mosques have been taken over by le liberal secular sellouts that are constantly advocating liberalization and attacking traditional Islam and have been doing so for the past 200 years? White nationalists want to complain about 
Oh no, King Arthur is being played by a black man on TV. That's what you consider white genocide. That's what you consider white replacement. But for Muslims, the actual figures of our history, like the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the caliphs, they're recast as pro-secular feminists and liberal human rights promoters. The wives of the Prophet and other important female figures are recast as Fortune 500 CEOs and strong independent career women. The Quran itself has been recast as some kind of charter for LGBT rights and individual freedom. These distorted representations are taught in many of our institutions. White nationalists want to complain about, oh no, we're being constantly surveilled, all our communications are being monitored, all our organizations are being infiltrated by feds, we're being placed on no-fly lists, our free speech is being censored. Yeah, try experiencing all that for 200 years. That's what the West has been doing to the Muslim world. And in the past 20 years, they've ramped it up with the global war on terror, which it must be noted was heavily supported by whites and especially white conservatives who wanted to bomb us back to the Stone Age. Now you're getting a small, now you're getting a small taste of your own medicine and you can't take it. Right now, they've just started labeling you as terrorists just because you have a few non-liberal beliefs. Who do you think they were originally labeling as terrorists for not being pro-democracy enough, not being pro-women's rights enough? I recognize many whites oppose this liberalization project. Like I said in the beginning, this is not a session for hating white people. However, if you, what you want to do is to assign collective blame, and you think it's obvious that the group that is entitled to blame others collectively is the white race, that is something that I would sincerely disagree with. And I want to present an alternative view, not because I want to condemn all whites or cast whites as the enemies of Islam, no. But if I were going to make, and I'm not, but if I were going to make the argument that one group deserves collective blame for the worst problems that we're facing today, to me, it seems like that group is whites. But I would emphasize one of the beautiful things about Islam, we don't get involved in these kinds of arguments like whites are racial enemies or blacks are racial friends. Our enemies and friends are not defined by the color of their skin. They're defined with reference to certain basic fundamental human values. But my message to white nationalists to conclude is this. Chickens are coming home to roost. Stop scapegoating other communities and take a look in the mirror. This monster of liberal modernity was made by whites, and to this day, it's being perpetuated primarily by whites. My theory is that white nationalists are resistant to identifying liberal secular modernity and unfettered technological and scientific growth as the cause of their problems because they believe that these things are the greatest achievements known to man. They say, we invented human rights. We invented free enterprise. We went to the moon while the rest of you were in your mud huts. If it turns out that these so-called achievements actually result in the extinction of mankind, then what does that say exactly about the white race? Islam, on the other hand, has given humanity a pure religion dedicated to worshiping God Almighty, a religion that preserves marriage, family, community, and deep devotion to God. Islam is the perfect system that all of humanity needs, no matter what color or ethnic origin. The only question is, will whites wake up in time? That's it. So we can just now have just open discussion. Mark, um, my opening was longer than yours, so if you want to respond, and I'll give you time to. I don't know what I don't know who you wrote that opening for. Whether you just did that so you could mouth off where you thought I was something that was deeply intelligent or moving, but you're really talking to the wrong person. I'm not a liberal. I'm not some secularist. I'm not an individualist. I stand against all of those things. I'm an ethno-nationalist. I believe in in-group preference. I believe in community. And I believe quite fundamentally that the people who foisted all of the things on the world that you are talking about as ills are people who were the cultural Marxists, people who own the Western media, people who have captured Western institutions. And disproportionately, those people are there's a massive overrepresentation amongst the Frankfurt School, the people who invented cultural Marxism, if you look up who pushed feminism, look it up. I mean, even Wikipedia admits when you put in feminism, there's a massive list of feminists longer than your arm. They were the ones that pushed the idea 
of female empowerment, of women going into the workplace, of women competing with men rather than working with them to form families. It is media and institutions which have pushed for the LGBT revolution that tell people that we should be proud that drag queens are performing in our schools. The vast majority of white people never pushed any of this. In fact, white people were subjected to this and slowly twisted and turned and bent through the propaganda machine that sits in the corner of their house, which is, of course, the television and who produces the vast majority of Hollywood uh, productions and television shows. You have to look at the people who are causing this and you have to look at the reason for them doing what they are doing. Now, people understand what Zionism is. Zionism isn't nationalism. Zionism is supremacism. Nationalism is not supremacism. I'm not a supremacist. And I acknowledge that the difference between Zionism and the difference between nationalism is Zionism is, in effect, a political system of placing who's above all others. And it seeks to do so by ensuring that all others have their culture taken from them, have their traditionalism smashed, and are reduced to the status of atomized individuals, whereas at the same time, ensuring that their group has the strongest in-group preference and sticks together. I think you're making a major mistake here, and your entire intro shouldn't really have been aimed at me, because I stand against all of the things you were talking about. And you can talk about the tragedy of people dying alone in their homes as individuals, and I'd agree with that. You can talk about the tragedy of people no longer getting married and having children, and I agree with that. Now, you can say, quite rightly so, that Western might has been used against Middle Eastern countries. And I agree with you. I already said that in my introduction. But it hasn't been done because that was what Western people wanted. The vast majority of people in the UK opposed war in Iraq. They opposed intervention in Syria. They didn't want bombing of the Middle East. The people who wanted the bombing of the Middle East, the people who wanted war in Iraq, were people who were bought and sold by the Zionist power mongers. Now, you can say this isn't true, but I'm sure if most of your supporters, most people in the chat actually looked into what I said, they would see that to be the case. I don't bear Muslims any ill will. I just acknowledge that the traditional cultures, the traditional ways of life of Europeans are different to that of Muslims. And I believe that we can work together on certain things. I believe that we can trade together. I can, I believe we can have um, you know, friendship, but I don't believe we should be doing so in the same country. And I think we should both acknowledge the people who are wielding their huge power to basically damage both of our groups. Now, when you proposed this to me, you didn't really tell me what the debate was going to be about. And you seem to be all over the place in what you're talking about. One minute you sound like you're talking to a liberal. One minute you're saying that whites almost have it coming, like this is coming home to roost. I don't believe that whites have it coming any more than I believe that Muslims have it coming when um, the Zionist warmongers flatten Islamic nations. I don't believe your people have it coming. I don't believe my people have it coming. I believe that both of our people need to pursue self-determination and essentially, on some levels, work together to reject the hyper-individualism, the liberalism, the secularism, the feminism, and all the other ills that attack us and undermine our communities. But if you look at the fountain where all of those ills spring from, it's not white people. It's just not. I mean, I, I disagree. Like, uh, if you seem to have a history of liberalism, and when I'm, when I'm talking about liberalism, I mean this overall philosophy of individual rights, maximizing liberty and equality. This did not begin like in the 1940s or the 1920s. This is the Enlightenment, and it was a white Enlightenment. You you mentioned feminists. Yeah, there's a lot of Jewish. Uh, feminist thinkers in the 20th century, but the history of feminism is is much earlier than the 20th century. It's much earlier than Marxism. 
Uh, Susan B. Anthony, was she, what was her race? Uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton. In fact, they were white supremacists. They believe in the superiority of the white race. And they also believe that the church needs to be destroyed, that we need to rewrite the Bible. Elizabeth Cady Stanton wrote the woman's Bible, like the, this kind of level of blasphemy. She's, she's, a, she's not only white, she's a white supremacist. These weren't Jewish. Jews were actually liberalized. Euro European Jews were living in ghettos. They're actually very Orthodox Jews at that time were extremely traditional people. They were liberalized actually by the Enlightenment post-French Revolution. Uh, this, this whole path of um, all these, this anti-traditionalism that you want to, you, both of us want to bemoan, the loss of religion, secularization, this predates uh, the prominence, the power. Look, I acknowledge that Jews today have a role. There are secularized Jews and other minorities as well. Unfortunately, Jews have a role. Let, let me just ask you a question. Yeah. What is the most powerful and pervasive and manipulative force on the planet? Liberalism. No. Try again. <laughs> the most powerful and pervasive force on the planet that invades our homes and informs people what to think is the media. Is that not correct? The Hollywood, Hollywood and the mainstream media is overwhelmingly the most powerful force when it comes to shaping people's minds, shaping people's opinions, and informing people what to think, and informing people on both a conscious and subconscious level of how they should behave. Surely you agree with that? Yes, they're very powerful. Media is so very powerful. Who, which group of people owns and runs Hollywood and which group of people is vastly overrepresented within the mainstream media. I can concede that a certain ethnic group Which group? No, I don't concede that Jews are the over the dominant power within media. I you think don't that there are believe that Jews are vastly overrepresented. It's whites and Hollywood. Jews. Whites and you Jews are cooperating. No, no, no. Right. How are do you how understand are you mathematics? Yes, I do. You do? Yeah. So, Jews in America make up around 2% of the population. Mm -hmm. So, they are vastly overrepresented within the media and Hollywood. I can concede that. I conceded that. I conceded that. That's a fact. Yeah. I conceded that. So but they're not the only people. one. They're not the only race. I didn't say they're the only one. Okay, that's, that's what I'm saying. That, so, then why are you focusing on that race alone? Because what I am saying... Disproportionate. Okay, I, I conceded you that. You are saying... That liberalism. Yeah, they're all liberals. Is, the the liberals are overrepresented. Liberalism has the, eaten away and the, destroyed values that we both care about, correct? Yes. And I'm saying what has been the biggest and most powerful vector for pushing said liberalism? Well, you have just conceded that is the mainstream media, that is Hollywood. And then I say to you, who are the people how about, who are vastly overrepresented within those bodies, within those institutions? How, and at that point, you then agree with me, but then you still blame whites. Yeah, because it's not just Jews who are involved in this. I didn't global, say it was just Jews. Here's a question. Here's a question. Here's a question. Here's a, here's a question for you. Who's overrepresented in global media? Do you think whites? No. Do you think whites are overrepresented? No. Whites are overrepresented in global media. If it was, if it was uh, equal representation in global media, you'd have just as many Hondurans and just as many Ukrainians and just as many Chinese in global media as you do whites. But no, it's whites that are overrepresented. But this is just not a. Uh, that's what your logic leads to, right? Well, no, if you if you believe so, if that's a problem. That, whites are overrepresented. Good for you. But what I'm saying <laughs> no, is, that's a fact. you will come unstuck, Daniel, because everyone who's listening to this can very quickly go and see who owns these big networks, who's it's in a lot of whites. power at these big networks. They can see who owns the Hollywood studios. They can see the names of the directors, the names of the producers. They can look at the people behind the advertising companies who are pushing all of these agendas, and they will find an awful lot of Steins and Bergs. Yeah, you also see, uh, see a lot of Murdochs. You also see a lot of Turners. You also see a lot of Buffets. You also see a lot of Whites. I mean, what's your point? They're what overrepresented. I get it. Is, They're if, overrepresented. So no, 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 no. If you came to a white nation and whites made up 
80% of the population, non-whites made up 18% of the population and just made up a further two and everyone was equally represented, I would see your point. But it's not like that. You have a vast over-representation within these institutions, within these uh, endeavors, which push for these things and that over-representation speaks volumes. And everything that you've cited in terms of things that are corrosive to things such as traditionalism, the family, masculine men, you know, being able to tell your daughter what, you know, she should wear or when she should be able to go out at night. All the things that you talk about have been corroded by primarily mainstream media because they haven't been enforced by the fist or the gun or the boot. They have been enforced by the slow and all pervasive process of the mainstream media twisting people's minds, changing people's opinions through both an attack on the conscious and the subconscious. This is a very important point. Now, obviously, you and I are going to differ on it, but I'm putting over my view. And I think some people in the chat will look at what I'm saying and say, well, this guy's got a point. You know, in the same way, as I said in my intro, we all know that the Palestinian people suffer at the hands of Zionists. Now, you know, and I know, that if there were Muslims killing another ethnic group, people would be talking about it. If there were whites wiping out another ethnic group, people would be talking about it. Remember South Africa? Everyone went on about apartheid. Apartheid was nowhere near as brutal as the destruction of the Palestinian people. And I say the destruction because it is a genocide at the hand of Zionists. Yet the mainstream media that never stopped talking about apartheid never talk about the horrors of what the Palestinian people go through. And there are never the kind of, the kind of pushback against the use of chemical weapons, the targeting of children, Palestinian children, at the hands of Israelis. Why? But, uh, Who owns the media? I'm, I'm fully on board with recognizing the uh, influence of Zionism in starting these kinds of wars in the Middle East. But they didn't start with Zionists, the colonial project, the genocide of Algerians by the French. There were no Jews or very little Jews involved. The colonization of Indonesia and Southeast Asia by the Dutch, that was not Jews <laughs> involved. The, this, the, the kind of starvation campaigns and genocide against the subcontinent, the Indian subcontinent in the 19th century. No, where were the Jews? Where were the Jews no, involved with that? Why, why can't you answer here? that? Like, why, why can't you answer here? that? You just, your history. What, yeah, I'm going to, I'm answering it now. Well, don't, I'm let me, let me finish my point. Let me finish my what point. What about all the can... Muslim invasions of Europe? What about Genghis Khan's invasions? What about the multiple wars and invasions and battles that took place throughout history? Those things are history and throughout this throughout history different groups both from the middle east both from europe from europe from other countries have all taken part in territorial conquest and territorial okay so now, is so now i don't actually agree with i don't believe in look how I you pivot there look at look at how you pivot there you want to it. focus on zionism then when i point out the crimes of white colonialism you pivot to oh everyone is doing no, no, it no. Everyone, well, okay. <laughs> that's very transparent. Look at the number of times that Europe was invaded by Muslim forces. Yeah. Uh, in, Let's talk about the middle, middle Ages. I'm not sitting here trying to castigate you for that. Why? One, you had nothing to do with it. Two, I came on here in good faith to try and find some middle ground with you. And three, and this is very important, the fact of the matter is. What is happening in the here and now is something we can change, we can affect, and we can try to push back against. So I'm talking about the things happening in the here and now. If you want a gigantic hot historical debate about all the times white people invaded somewhere, and I bring up all the times Islamic nations or uh, the Ottoman Empire or maybe Genghis Khan or somebody else invaded somewhere, well, that's a historical discussion, which is slightly different. And what you're trying to do, and I don't understand why you're doing this, is you are dragging all of this away from the issue of Zionism. Now, 
I have tried. Because that's not the problem. That's not the problem. The problem is liberalism. The problem is liberalism. Because if you get rid of the Zionist influence, if you get rid of all of the multiculturalism, the white race is not going to have a future. Imagine that all of everything that you want in an ethno state is there. You still have the liberalism. You still have the progressivism. You still have the emphasis on technological innovation and progress. But you have no more multi... Uh, culturalism and no more Zionism. Is that going to be a future uh, for Britain or the UK or any white nation? No. You're still going to have the LGBT. You're still going to have the drag queens. You're still going to but have the uh, the abortion. You're still. But Daniel, they were. They're, they're the originators of. They're the why, originators why of liberal. Okay. Do you know the history well, of look, liberalism? Do you know if, what liberalism if is? If that's what you want to believe, good for you, big guy. Well, make because some points ca contrary to it. The vast majority of people in Western nations. Until that little box sat in the corner of every house spilling forth its poison were traditionalists, conservative with a small c, and were part of tight-knit communities that looked after each other. There has been a rapid and absolutely corrosive change taking place in the West post-World War II when there was a huge, huge power shift and the mainstream media became the pervasive force in our lives when it came to the formation of our opinions. And this pulled white people away from listening to those within the church, listening to those within the community, listening to their elders, because instead of people listening to their fathers, their elders, their church leaders, they were looking at role models placed on the TV who were bad role models. And this was all part of a nefarious scheme to plunge the West into madness. And now the West is basically under control of these people. They use the Western might to bomb the Middle East. And the Middle East suffers because of who really controls the West. And that is why I come on here really today, because I have a degree, a large degree of sympathy for those in the Middle East who suffer at the hands of the Zionist war machine. I have a great deal of sympathy for whites. I have a great deal of sympathy for Europeans and Americans. I've lived in America and Texas for um, most of my life. I have a great deal of sympathy as well. And that's why I want whites to recognize that the problem that they have is with this ideology of liberalism that far predates the television set it far predates the wars in the middle east it far predates immigration this is a endemic problem with a certain ideology and that's what needs to be recognized otherwise there is no future for anyone, not just whites. This is a force that has been attacking and destroying all traditional cultures and religions. You say that you want to, you're a re, um, traditional person, Mark. Don't you consider the loss of religion in Europe and the death of Christianity? Don't. What do you think has has caused that? It started not in the 20th century. That secularization started with the Enlightenment. It started with the French Revolution. Well, you know the, you do you know the history? Example. Do you know the history of the French Revolution? Let me Mark? give you a wonderful example of secularism. And this is from the United States. In the United States, there has been a massive push to remove Christianity from all public places and public buildings to create a secular nation. That is true. Now, all of the founding fathers of America were Christians, and it was founded by white people from Christian nations who wanted to set up an explicitly Eurocentric Christian nation. However, despite crosses and other Christian symbols being banned in public areas and, on pub and in public buildings in America as part of this secularization and the growth of atheism, what do you see every year on the White House lawn? A huge 12 foot tall menorah. So I'll ask you this, Daniel, if you can't display a cross in the White House or in an American public building, why can you display a menorah? You can keep bringing on these points and I'm not, why can you I'm not disputing, I'm not disputing the disproportionate influence of certain groups on American politics. I'm not disputing that. So you can keep bringing up these points about the influence of Zionism on Western politics. 
But that doesn't change the fact that the seeds of the enlightenment, this, why do you think Europe was so open? Why do you think American studios or Hollywood, why do you think TV broadcast stations and news and national media were so open to the influence of one particular group? Don't whites, the majority white share the blame, share the, uh, or have the blame for allowing this kind of terrible situation, if we can concede all of your points, who allowed this to happen? You see that what we are experiencing today with cultural Marxism, say, or with the disproportionate influence of Zionism, say, the, there was a stage set that led to the 20th century. You want to bemoan, you know, third wave feminism or second wave feminism and say that, oh, there are all these Jewish feminists involved. Well, what about first wave feminism? You couldn't have second I wave feminism. You, know, you can't I have could, second and third wave feminism without first wave feminism. Where I, would feminism. Just lead, where I would just read the name of these Jewish feminists. Yeah, I, re I read you the names of Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Mary Wol uh, Wollstonecraft, all of these feminists, hardcore anti-patriarchy feminists that are railing against the Catholic Church and the Church of England and the Bible, they predate any Jewish feminist that you can name me. Simone de Beauvoir, was she Jewish? No. This, uh, how much bigger of a feminist can you have than that? How much more influential of a feminist? I can give you a list. Yeah, okay, you can give me a list, but you're not I addressing... Give you a massive you're, list. It seems like you have this selective vision. This is what makes white nationalism... This is what makes white nationalism not compelling. Because no, you no, want no, no, to no. criticize... You, you, want to you, you want to criticize one group... You want to criticize one group without acknowledging your own... Your simple own mathematics. <laughs> you don't understand over-representation. So... I, Look at when the question. See, if if overrepresentation is a if problem, who owns who owns all of the who of owns the people within a group within a specific uh, endeavor or in a specific uh, mindset or in a specific industry? That says something about that industry. I'm not saying every single feminist is Jewish, and I'm not saying all Jewish all Jews are feminists. I am saying that feminists when you look at feminists on an ethnic level, the vast majority of them are Jews who are massively overrepresented yet again. And this is something that you seem to have blinkers on. There, because you understand, here, here's a math lesson. You understand the difference, you do. understand the difference between overrepresentation and the majority. A group can be overrepresented, but still be a minority. The majority so of if we say, leading if feminists we say, are Jews or were <sighs> Jews. The founders of feminism, feminism were white Europeans. Just as the cultural Marxists, the Frankfurt School... <laughs> so you can't School. respond to that. No, you can't respond to anything. Because what you're going to do is you're going to sit here... I can see it. <laughs> you're going to sit here smugly smiling. And the fact is, you're not going to acknowledge the people who are slaughtering Muslims wholesale in the Middle yeah, East. A lot of Europeans were doing Because you keep your YouTube channel. You know, no. you can rub your beard as much as you want, but the truth is, I'm not on YouTube because I tell the truth. You are on YouTube. No, I've been banned as well. I've been banned from. I have been banned from social media truth. as well. You know why? For criticizing liberalism. I've also been banned. I've been banned from Twitter. Who knows if this channel is going to last on YouTube? Who knows? <laughs> Maybe not after this uh, debate. But I'm in under threat of being also banned. Why? Because I criticize liberalism. Because that's the real problem. That's the real enemy. It's this liberal system. And yes, I can. I, <laughs> I can concede. I can say, concede the overrepresentation or an ideology is the problem. But you see, I look behind the ideology at the people who are pushing it and the ways they push it upon us. And I see the results of that. And I see that those people are also pushing multiculturalism. And multiculturalism is going to create a clash of cultures in places it exists. I don't believe, and we've even seen that in the Middle East. We've seen arbitrary boundaries drawn. We've seen different uh, tribes, different people uh, pushed together into the same area. And that's created war. That's created slaughter. I don't want that. I believe, and I've said this in my opening, I believe that all peoples of the world deserve a place to call their own, where they can take their destiny in their own hands. I don't wish Muslims in the Middle East any harm whatsoever. In fact, I'd like to see them prosper. I'd like to see Islam in the Middle East flourish and have the foot of Zionism taken off its neck 
so that it can actually go in the direction it wants to go and those people can be free because I am not a colonialist, I'm not a globalist and I'm not somebody who wants to see other people suffer. I want my people to flourish but I'd be happy for other people to flourish as well because that's the difference between nationalism and Zionism. Nationalism is something that can exist with multiple different people taking on their own visions of nationalism. Zionism only exists when all other people are beneath the Zionist. Look, we can talk about British colonialism. This is significant when we want to talk about feminism. Why? Because feminism, the people who came into Egypt, came into Algeria, came into India, came into Indonesia and told Muslim women, hey, you should take off the veil and you should be okay with fornicating and you should fight against uh, your barbaric Muslim uh, fathers and husbands. It was white col colonizers. It was Lord Cromer. It was these colonial officials from France and from Britain. They were not Jewish. They were white. This is the history of the 19th century. And this is something that you refuse to acknowledge. And the thing is that if you, we, this ethno state utopia that you uh, are advocating for, Muslims in their own country, whites in their own country, as long as there, there is liberalism and this idea that we have to spread these values of freedom and. I don't believe equality. in liberalism. You don't, okay, you don't, but most white nationalists do. Most no, white nationalists believe Who's, in liberalism. White nationalists don't believe in... What are you even talking about? Liberalism. White nationalists rail against liberalism constantly. We don't believe in liberal values. We believe... You don't in believe in democracy. You don't believe in democracy. You don't believe in secularism. We don't believe in secularism. And we don't believe... We don't believe in the kind of democracy... You believe in a Christian state. No. You believe in a Christian... The, uh, Britain we should believe, be a Christian state. If you read our... If you actually read our literature... Most of our people either want to live in a Christian state or are actually practicing other ancient European religions. We don't want to believe, we don't want to live in some secular state where there's multiple religions all rubbing up alongside each other. No, that's not what we want to live in. We want to live in ethno states. We want to live in states which are defined by our people. Europe is the land for the Europeans. I mean, Europe you can have a, you can have a country. People and largely by Christianity for a good number of years for many hundreds of years and that's how we want it to stay but we all but but equally we want you guys white nationalists want you guys to have the same in the middle east we want you guys to have your own countries and your own spaces and we're against zionist wars we're against colonialism we're against uh, american western imperialism you're not, you're, you're not you're not representative you're not representative of whites that's the problem you're no liberal I'm not you can have you can have I'm, I'm a white nationalist yeah i know so the problem is that you have an ethno if you would have an ethno state full of liberal like you can have an ethno state that is just full of gay whites gay atheist whites that would also be an ethno state wouldn't it what <laughs> but this is a, this is the most ridiculous point i've ever heard i don't want homosexuality to be pushed as a norm I don't want homosexual couples to be adopting children. I do not want the LGBT agenda to be pushed in schools. I do not want drag queens going in to schools and singing to children. It's sickening. And when I see Muslims so, so if that's railing what you against want. this, when I see Muslims railing against this, I praise them for doing so. And I say, well, hands up, these guys are doing something good. Because I join you on that. But, and but this, is the, this intro, is the contradiction. We have a lot in common. This is the contradiction though, Mark, because you want traditionalism, you want Christian values, but you also want to embrace the enlightenment. You know how anti-Christianity no, and anti- Stop telling me what I want. <laughs> I that, want so you reject the enlightenment. You reject the I enlightenment. I want a, I just told you what I want. I want a traditionalist, European ethno state, and I agree with you on the issues of LGBT, degeneracy, uh, women's liberation, feminism. So I don't know why you're trying to argue that point with me. Because you, if you're trying to argue that point, you should just say, Well, actually, Mark, we agree, and talk about something else, or bring on somebody who's going to argue that point with you. Because I don't want those things. <laughs> Simple. That's a contradiction in the sense that you can't have all of the traditionalism that you're advocating for 
while also endorsing the enlightenment values of I'm not progress. endorsing any of that. I just said that. So I don't know why you keep saying that I'm endorsing liberalism. I'm not. I hate liberalism. The end. Draw a line under it. I don't like liberalism. Why don't you want to agree with me? Because I'm saying to you, I agree with you, Daniel. The points you've raised against mm -hmm. liberalism are correct. I agree with you. Liberalism is cancer. It is corrosive. It is poison. I have already stated who I believe are overrepresented in pushing that poison. You don't agree with me on that bit, but we both agree on the poison. So why don't we just draw a line under the poison and say we agree on it? Okay. Because so I'm not me... pushing it. I don't want it pushed. Yeah. So I, you might understand the implications of rejecting the Enlightenment, rejecting secularism. Then this you want theocracy because Britain was a theocracy. The European history is full of theocracies. This is what you want. That's news to me. I don't see you advocating for Christianity. I don't see you advocating uh, for a theocratic Christian ethnostate. I see you advocating for an ethnostate. So this is news to me. I'm surprised by that. Uh, because usually when I'm discussing with other white nationalists or I see what white nationalists are writing online, they are big advocates of the enlightenment, secular values, democratic values, equality, and the main criticism against Islam I've and Muslims. I even made a video called Democracy Doesn't Work. I rail against a two-party illusory democracy almost every week on my show. So I don't understand... It, look, Daniel, I don't want to be rude to you, right? I came on here on your channel without a moderator in mm. good faith because I thought we were going to find some things that we agreed on. Now, I am going to take you in good faith and say that you didn't know what I really believed. But I am not a liberal. I am not somebody who believes in all of the things that you're railing against. I rail against them also. And in my opening statement, I tried to be as conciliatory toward you as possible and talk about things that we could get on with because I would rather make a friend here. I would rather have an understanding with your audience than I would make an enemy and have zero understanding because I believe that although I've already said I want an ethno state and I don't think Europe's the place for Islam, I do believe we have a number of common enemies and I believe that we have a number of points that we agree on. So you have, you know, children. Great. You're a father. You don't want your children to be taught that homosexuality is a healthy, normal, or even preferential way of life to normal heterosexual relations. You don't want that, do you? No. Nope. Boom. Neither do I, my friend. Neither do I. It sickens me. The thought of your children or my child going to school and being told or watching TV shows and being told or being told in any way that that kind of degeneracy is basically normal and healthy is something that upsets me. And I'm sure it upsets you. So that's something we've got in common, yeah? So I think that we can find common ground. Like I... In, I'm saying this in good faith. I did not know that you had such pro-theocracy views. Um, could you agree that we need theocracy in the world? Like even, you know, yeah. on a global level, we need theocracy, right? We Look, need, and Muslim countries need Sharia. Muslim countries need um, this kind of Islamic rule. Yeah, That's very yeah, anti. Want you guys to have uh -huh. Islamic rule, and I even acknowledge there are there's different types of Islam. There's Sunni Islam. There's a there's a I lost the name there's Shiite and Sunni Islam mm. and I believe that the Sunni Muslims should be allowed to take their people in the direction they want and the Shiites should be able to take their people in the direction they want I've even done full afternoon discussions with um, Muslims in Syria where they've agreed with me and I've agreed with them and we both said that together as white nationalists and as Syrian Muslims we want to stand united against the people, and I agreed with, he agreed with me about the Zionist power. We said we wanted to stand together against the destruction of Syria. And I want the Shiite Muslims who live in Syria to take power into their hands 
And if they want a theocracy and an Islamic theocracy, they should be allowed to have that and good for them. And if we in the West, because I believe in an ethno state in the West, if we want a Christian theocracy and many of our um, ancestors enjoyed living in a Christian theocracy where there was strong morals, people went to church, there was a community, good for them. In my book, The Fall of Western Man, I talk about the importance of the church, not just as um, a spiritual guiding light for our people, but also as a moral guiding light and a cornerstone of the community. So I'm with you on that as well. I'm not fighting you on that, Daniel. So, yeah, I, this is something that I'm surprised by. I did not know that you were so <laughs> pro-theocracy and pro... Um, so you, it's a Protestant theocracy that you are in favor of, or is it non-denominational? I think in the UK, I would say that people would largely be described as a Christian. But that takes in sort of Catholic, Protestant, and I am always raised Church of England. I'm a confirmed Christian. I'm a godfather to a little boy. Uh, I would go to church regularly, but our churches have been completely twisted. The people who run our churches push the liberalism. And one thing I also respect about Muslims is that in your mosques, you reject liberalism and you haven't let that liberalism creep in. And that's something I respect because we have allowed that liberal poison to destroy our houses of worship. So do you think there's any contradiction with uh, Britons being Muslim or becoming converting into Islam? I think that we have slightly different value systems, as I said earlier, and there have been problems between Islamic communities and white communities in Britain. There have been not as much by people from the Middle East, but specifically by Pakistani Muslims who have done quite a number of, um, well, a large number of sexual crimes towards white girls. Now, that's something I don't, of course, I rail against that. I've spoken about that a lot. I don't think that is a good thing. I think that's a product of multiculturalism. But the people I blame for the most part for that is actually the British state for importing those people and largely covering up those crimes. But I haven't focused on that this evening because I didn't want to get into that. And I didn't want to be put in a position where you and I were having some adversarial debate. I, I wanted to find more middle ground. Well, I, you know, just so we're clear, I condemn any grooming. I condemn uh, Pakistanis or any kind of Muslim who engages in this kind of behavior. In fact, I think that they should be executed. Well, can um, I make a point? Can I make a point? Go ahead. Right. I don't like the grooming gangs. Over 100,000 white British girls have been abused by these um, Islamic grooming gangs here in the UK. But I didn't really want to raise this because I don't blame you for it because you didn't do it. And you've been very honest and you said you would execute those men because you don't believe what they're doing is right. Now I'm gonna say this to you. I believe that those men and women sitting in parliament who are authorizing the bombing of the Middle East, who are authorizing arms being sent to all manner of groups who are causing terror in the Middle East, at the behest of what I believe is the Zionist state of Israel. I am against those men and women, just as you said you were against the groomers, and I would have them up in front of court for war crimes. I would have people like Tony Blair in court up for war crimes. They do not represent me. I am a nationalist. I do not agree with people who want to destroy or rape the Middle East. Yeah, so that's a lot of common ground over there on that issue. I mean, the thing about the point that I would make, not against you, because you made it very clear you believe in traditional Christianity, um, not liberalized Christianity, but the point I would make to someone who is not you, um, someone who is more uh, in favor of the liberal enlightenment, I'd say that, look, even if you got rid of these grooming gangs, you still have widespread um, prostitution, you have widespread... Um, pornography, you have all these kinds of new apps that are constantly being developed to facilitate fornication. So this is... This I'd is, outlaw pornography. I made a video on pornography. 
Uh, it's called the doll in pornography. You'll never guess who were overrepresented in the start of the porn industry. Well, it's that group again. And I'll tell you this, I would ban all internet pornography. I think it's an absolute scandal. And I think the kind of pornography being pumped out from America at the moment is some of the most corrosive, vile and degenerate filth you could ever imagine. And the fact that young boys grow up and young girls grow up from the age of 11 or 12, sometimes even younger, watching these movies and viewing these images on their smartphones, this is a scandal. This is child abuse. This is corrosive, not just to my people, but also to your people. It's not just corrosive to Christians or whites. It's corrosive to Arabs. It's corrosive to Muslims. It's corrosive you know, to Hindus and Sikhs. It's corrosive to the whole world. But again, I urge people to watch my video, this role in the porn industry, and have a look for yourself. You can watch it, Daniel, and you can write to me and say, Mark, I still think you're wrong, but it's 20 minutes of your life. Have a look. See what these people say. See what they say is their motivation. I did it as a documentary. It's all cited with citations. I'm not saying this. Even uh, if even if it were, you know, Indians who are overrepresented in the porn industry or this, this issue of overrepresentation... Um, I've conceded all of that, but the point that I would make is that this this degeneracy has roots that go back 200 years. It starts with the enlightenment that leads step by step like a domino effect to the kind of degeneracy that we're seeing, the sexual revolution. So if we want this kind of collective blame against Jews, it's not very coherent because there are other ethnic groups that are also overrepresented. And all of the degeneracy when it comes to pornography, are whites globally overrepresented in the porn industry? Yes, they are, because the majority of the world is not white. Uh, so this is this question of overrepresentation. I, I feel like you're using it in an inconsistent way. But uh, going back to the common ground, you've said that you you disagree with the Enlightenment. You said that you disagree with these kinds of values of continuous progress and human rights. Um, this kind of international human rights norms. So you've already cons- you know agreed to all of that. Um, so and so I learned a lot about what your views on these things are. But again, I would say that you are a minority amongst whites, um, but I'm not even, a even white amongst, nationalists. But I'm not a minority amongst white nationalists. Would you Richard, know that someone like Richard the Spencer. Leading voices, I am one of the leading voices amongst white nationalists worldwide and certainly here in the UK. And I am one of the leading voices because I represent a huge number of people who feel very similar to the way I feel and agree with on the majority of things when it comes to liberalism, when it comes to Zionism, when it comes to colonialism. None of us are colonialists, none of us are liberals, none of us are pro-Zionism. We all believe in those in those overarching ideals that I stated in my introduction of people being able to live side by side in different countries, trading with each other, letting each other flourish, learning from each other. You know, I am not saying I cannot learn anything from you or I have nothing that I can gain from you. And I'm sure there's some things you may be able to learn from me or gain from me. But the fact is, I also believe that it is a nefarious and very dangerous plot by people who are in charge of this globalist agenda to push Muslims into Western nations to create conflict. And I do believe that creates conflict. I, w- I believe that when there are people living alongside each other and there are, there are significant differences between them, I believe that does create conflict. And I believe this is being done to create conflict. I believe this is all part of a large plan. A certain group of people cause Western nations to bomb the Middle East. This creates huge numbers of refugees. This creates large movements of people. The same group of people who call for these bombing campaigns then say, oh, the West should open their borders and let all these people in. These people come in and then that creates a clash of cultures. It creates uh, multicultural problems. And these problems basically 
bring about a clash of cultures within Western nations. And what I'm saying is, if you took away the wars in the Middle East, if you took away mass immigration and you let people flourish in peaceful separation, things would be better for us all. I don't want conflict. I want the very opposite. I mean, I think the thing that Muslims will say and what I'll say with your criticism of multiculturalism is that Muslims haven't had the same experience, negative experience with multiculturalism. Um, Muslims love multiculturalism. We love, because this is, if you look at the Islamic empires, even in history, they were very multicultural. But what made that work um, is a united uh, belief in God, a united commitment to God, um, commitment to religious practices and rituals and this is cr this creates such a strong glue that people of different races and ethnicities and cultures can live very peacefully and flourish together in in one geographic region I agree with you completely that if you bring different cultures and races and there is and you put them together without any kind of unifying belief that that's going to lead to chaos. I agree with that. I agree with that. Um, but, but again, look at the people who are pushing the multicultural agenda. And I'm not going to force you into letting me say who they are or anything like that. I'm just saying, I would like everyone who's interested in what we're saying, look into this. Look into the people who have pushed for open borders, who have pushed for multiculturalism. And here's a tip. Here's a tip. The same people that have pushed for multiculturalism in the West are the same people who vehemently advocate for an ethno state for themselves in the Middle East and then turn a blind eye to the ethnic cleansing of the Palestinian people. Yes, it's a big problem. It's a big problem. Um, Zionism is a big problem. So, I mean, I want to ask you, since you're in favor of theocracy, do you believe in things like blasphemy laws? Do you believe in, or, or do you believe in, like, uh, punishing fornication or having, making, illegalizing uh, sex outside of marriage? How are you exactly going to preserve some of these traditional institutions like marriage and family? Well, that's very interesting. Now, I believe every nation or every group of people would have their own ways to institute such social changes or such social pressures. Now, in the UK... Um, before liberalism took hold, these things didn't really need to be punished by law. They were punished by social ostracism. So if you had a woman who was dressing terribly, if you were having a woman who was going around, you know, the village or the town, sleeping with every man or trying to sleep with married men, she would be ostracized. She would be shamed and everyone would ignore her and that would push her out of any social circles. So these social pressures, which were basically led by thinking from the church or from uh, conservatives, conservatives or traditionalists, this was pushed by the community. Now that might be different to how things are done in the Middle East, but that was our way. And now what you see with liberalism is an attack on that. So if I say, stay away, if I had a son and I said, stay away from this girl, she sleeps around a lot. Liberals would say, Mark slut shaming her. In the same way, they say, basically what liberalism has done is liberalism prevents you from shaming things that are shameful, but shames conservatives, traditionalists, and those who are religious for standing up for moral values. So it inverts shame and directs shame at people who aren't shameful and direct shame away from people who in fact should be the people who bear the most shame. Yeah, Muslims have the same kind of conception of um, shame and also social ostracization that prevents things leading up to the point where um, fornication happens or adultery happens. Um, and, and veiling, for example, is part of that veiling the concept of honor, a concept of separation of the genders, a practice of lowering the gaze. These are all things to prevent um, fornication from happening. How would you deal with the um, atheism issue, though? Because 
if you have, if you don't have any kind of restrictions on speech, preventing people from blaspheming, preventing people from agitating against the church or the uh, Islamic religion, then this leads to a kind of a direction, a directionality of atheism within society. Is there, you know, what in this Christian ethno state, how would that be addressed? Well, I think what you've seen in the UK, and again, you've seen this primarily pushed by the mainstream media, is the public mockery of Jesus Christ, the public mockery of Christianity. And it's very interesting in the UK. And this is something you have to understand. And again, I'm very thankful you're giving me the chance to explain this. In the UK, there are five protected characteristics that you cannot insult people for. You cannot insult people on the basis of race, disability, gender, sexuality, or religious affiliation. But there are some exemptions to that. When it comes to gender, you can insult men. When it comes to race, you can insult whites. When it comes to religion, you can insult Christians. So you have hideous shows on the BBC, like Jerry Springer, the opera, which portrays Jesus as a bizarre, um, perverse man-child who walks around in a nappy wetting himself. Now, that is sickening. Now, in the UK, if you said that about uh, Mohammed, you'd be put in prison. If you said that about somebody who was um, well, revered by Jews or Hindus, you'd be put in prison. But you can say this about Christianity. And what I would say is that ultimately... These sort of laws were never really needed in the UK because we were very respectful, traditional, conservative. But again, it's the media who has basically, has basically gone all out to turn Jesus Christ into the subject of ridicule. And that needs to be dialed back uh, massively because ultimately I don't want people to be completely restricted and controlled but at the same time, what is happening now, and this is what I'm trying to say to you, is that ultimately anybody who takes a sledgehammer to decency, morality and religion is a hero and he's afforded free speech. But anyone who says, well, actually, I stand for religion, morality, decency, conservatism and traditionalism is basically at best, deplatform from social media, and at worst, put in jail for it. Well, Muslims take a little bit more stricter, even when it comes to the insult of uh, Jesus Christ, uh, peace be upon him, because Muslims know that he is a Messiah and, and a prophet. So even in Muslim societies, mocking Jesus or uh, his mother, the Virgin Mary, this is met with, uh, you know, execution, <laughs> the death penalty uh, for things like this. Um, but I mean, I don't think controlling media would be enough because when we look at the history of blasphemy in Europe, um, look at a figure like Voltaire and the kind of things that he was saying to mock Christianity. Many of the Enlightenment thinkers actually um, had a very negative view of traditional Christianity um, in the you know cusp of the 18th century, 19th centuries. So it. I think a more strict and less compromising uh, punishment for those who engage in this kind of uh, behavior because there's they're agitators and they are destroying the glue of society by undermining belief in God, by undermining belief in the religion through mockery. So it, to prevent atheism, to prevent um, um, deviance and heresy, there needs to be a very... A strong response. Um, this is what Islam offers and blasphemy, I think, was punished within uh, Christian history. It, it certainly was. Heresy yeah. was pun punished also with, um, you know, uh, capital punishment, actually. Um, so well, one of the ways we used to deal with things in Western nations is we had huge amounts of etiquette manners and politeness was something that was drummed into you when you were very very small when i was a small child the idea 
of people swearing in public or swearing in front of a woman would be absolutely frowned upon. The idea of saying something that would be seen as grossly offensive to uh, somebody's religion would be frowned upon. But the problem is now, as I said, this has been popularized. This has been made to be cool. And in my book, I state this. Ultimately, all of the good role models we used to have, so the father figures, the religious leaders, the community leaders, strong, heroic national heroes, all of those things have been torn down. They have been mocked, they have been ridiculed, and they've been put in the bin. That then creates a vacuum. Our enemies then ably fill that vacuum by placing on a pedestal degeneracy, madness, overindulgence, individualism, hedonism, sexualization. And our young people, instead of looking at the good things they used to, look at the terrible things that have been placed in front of them, and young people are very impressionable. They then emulate those new terrible role models with all those terrible characteristics, and they become terrible. And I believe that Islam and Christianity both sought to place good, healthy role models for their people on a pedestal. But those role models have been toppled and people are social animals. We are social animals and we copy what is in front of us. So if you put evil in front of us, we begin to be twisted to that evil. If you put good in front of us, we then shape ourselves to be like the good that we see. So this is what I meant with the TV. The TV always places evil, degeneracy, sex, obesity, madness, drug abuse, alcoholism. Every ill you could think of in the world is put in front of our young people, not as an ill or an evil, but as a virtue by the television. No, I, I completely agree that the de degeneracy um, is amplified through mass media, through Hollywood, um, with the most disgusting kinds of role models that are put in front of people. The music industry is another one. Um, yeah, so the thing is that, um, unfortunately, this kind Wait, of... Can I ask you a question? Yeah. You don't have a daughter, do you? No. But if you did have a daughter you wouldn't want her watching music videos by Cardi B, would you? No. It would terrify you. I have a daughter. We do not let her have screen time. The only time she sees a screen is when she calls her uh, grandma for a video call. That's it. Because we don't want her growing up twerking we don't want her growing up seeing people on music videos that are wearing skirts like belts and thinking that's the best way to draw a male's attention because these things are poisons but again i urge you i urge you daniel look at the names of the people <laughs> who run the music industry because this is this is perverting our people and it will eventually pervert yours if if every islamic nation is eventually subjected to the same ills that the West is. And if you've got any friends or if you've got any family members or if you've got any people here in the chat from the Middle East, I want to speak to them as well, because I'm going to say to these guys something you would not expect me to say. Look at the West. Look at how mighty, proud and decent we were. Look how we fell from grace. Look how we fell into madness. And do not let your nations go the same way. Do not sit a TV in every corner of your in, in every corner of every room of your house. Do not let the media in. Do not let your nations and your people go down the same route that we have. Because if you do, you will end up like us. And something that people always say to me, they say that often. Muslims have a certain degree of contempt for the West because they see us as corrupted and weak and perverse and hedonistic and materialistic and individualistic. Yes, but the same will happen to you if you end up worshipping the television instead of your religion. But it's not just television. Like, look at, again, we don't want to talk about the 
long colonial history because a lot of the femini feminism liberalization came in the 19th century to the Muslim world by force and the laws that were made to deliberately liberalize uh, secularize Muslims. Look at the statements of Lord Cromer, Lord Cromer, Evelyn Baring. His whole project was to secularize Muslims by making them adopt the sensibilities of this kind of uh, liberal European uh, aristocratic class. Like this is the history of the Middle East. And, and today it's also not the influence of just television and social media. Those are definitely, as you say, a huge influence. But you have international human rights law. You have NGOs, NGOs that are going. Many of them are funded through um, uh, actual Western governments. The EU funds a lot of these NGOs who go to the Muslim world preaching feminism, telling women that you need to leave your family, you need to leave the home and actually go work and make money and become independent, um, changing all kinds of marriage laws, changing all kinds of um, inheritance laws, destroying basically the traditional Islamic laws that maintain cohesive families, a strong families, strong marriages. This is happening at the hands of liberalism. And, and so I think, but we agree, we agree that it's liberalism yeah, that, but I've, I've got to say, I whether it's liberalized Jew, overrepresented liberal Jews, we can concede that liberal, you know, even if it's Muslims, even if it's Indians, you know, liberalized Indians and Muslims are now a big part of this program. Unfortunately, I'm constantly fighting with them. I'm constantly arguing against these liberalized Muslims uh, if you can call them Muslims, they're more just brown people who are pushing feminism, who are pushing secularism, democracy onto traditional Muslim societies, trying to outlaw uh, blasphemy laws that we have, that we did have in the past, have uh, laws in Islamic law against uh, fornication, against homosexuality, uh, trying to imitate the opposite gender. All of these things are prohibited in Islam. Yet that those are being undone by these different groups that share one common thread, which is liberalism, a uh, devotion to this liberal ideology. But I mean, there's one other point that I think should be emphasized because I think you agree with me. We're on common ground, the same page when it comes to liberal values. But part of liberal values is the idea of scientific progress scientific progress and industrialization. So even if we were to have these separate states, these separate ethno, quasi ethno religious states, um, there is still the question of technological uh, progress. I'm not an anarcho primitivist, but there is a lot to say about how technological progress, if it is left unchecked, uh, will lead to uh, great social ill and social harm and even threatens the human race when we talk about uh, transhumanism or we talk about you know uploading the consciousness to the cloud or genetic engineering or nuclear weapons, uh, weapons of mass destruction, mass surveillance, all of these things are the fruits of scientific progressivism and the industrial revolution. Um, so that's also a big part of the equation. So I, I'm interested to hear your take on this question of uh, technology or white nationalists in general. What do they think about the future of technology? Oh, well, I think you'll find that we agree on that as well. Now, that is mm. something that you might not have thought <laughs> I say, but I deal with a lot of young men. I work with specifically uh, young women as well, but usually young men who have fallen um, into bad habits and a lot of young people today who have fallen into bad habits have fallen into those habits due to the fact that technology is no longer a tool for us, which is what technology should be. Technology should be a tool that we wield. But now it's almost like technology is something that controls us, if you know what I mean. So we're not using technology as a tool, technology has grown into such a pervasive force that it surrounds us completely. It cuts us off from our friends, our family, our community, our religion, and it ultimately makes us more individualistic. It makes us more atomized. And especially with young men, they become addicted to computer games. 
they become addicted to watching screens they don't go outside they are no longer fit and healthy they put on weight they stop doing sports they stop doing exercise and for young women young women use technology in a different way often they watch gossipy shows soap operas and then play out their own soap operas on social media where they become exhibitionists where they show off more and more of their body on facebook and instagram and twitter they then use sites like OnlyFans to sell their knickers and their naked pictures and they become the stars of their own little social media drama worlds and all of this has come from technology now it's very interesting because we talk about ethno states but japan is quite close to being an ethno state but has been ravaged by the same issue as we're talking of now it's been ravaged by the issue of technology taking over people's lives and separating people from their communities and also the natural world so i think that whilst technology is a wonderful thing technology must be something held in check and people must never lose their connection with the natural world, their family or their community. Because if they do, and if they let technology become their master, they will lose their way in, in life and they will end up destroying themselves. Yeah, so there's a lot of common ground on, on that as well. Um, a lot of white nationalists or maybe they're white supremacists, not you, um, not characterizing your views, but they have this kind of attitude that... Um, non-whites are primitive or they do not have the uh, ability to create a beautiful civilization uh, in large part because they do not, do not have the IQ or they do not have the analytic mind that is capable. Um, and, you know, my position on that is I can concede that there are differences between different races, but we're all created by God and we all have the capacity to be righteous, to be pious servants of God and worship him alone without partners and concede that, yeah, there are different races. We, we're created with different tongues. We're different uh, languages, different colors of the skin and different, you know, maybe racial capacities or personalities. I can concede all of that. Muslims can concede all of that while recognizing um, that everyone has something valuable to offer. Everyone has this capacity to be servants of God. The problem is, um, and, and everyone can contribute to a very flourishing, robust um, society and civilization. This is, what, this is what we see in the history of Islam. But um, this focus on individualism and uh, high IQ analytic ability, some might argue against white nationalism that if we allow whites to have um, their own country uh, and their own ethno state what ha will happen is exactly what happened in the history of europe they will secularize because of inherent white uh, uh racial characteristics that they have they will they will secularize they will develop technologies that because of the high iq actually and this will eventually lead to an existential threat for the rest of the world and this is actually what we are experiencing with transhumanism and weapons of mass destruction uh, and, and what's ironic is that you do have white nationalists not you but others who will have this triumphalist attitude towards technology like yes we you know went to the moon we invented the airplane the car the computer <laughs> all of these kinds of technologies that have fundamentally transformed uh human life and human nature uh it, and will lead to the destruction of humankind overall these are things that you're praising and and feeling like they are great successes for the white race but i know that from what you're saying that you don't agree with that no, I think, look, I think invention and technology is a great thing, but that technology has to be used for good. So, you know, if you invent um, an aeroplane and you use that aeroplane to move um, medical equipment around and save people's lives, great. If you use it to drop bombs on children, that's not great that's evil and i think it's about the way technology is used and rather than technology being held in check and being used as a tool and being used wisely it has now been 
unleashed in a way where the technology rules us and we don't rule the technology. So like the, it's almost as if the tool is controlling us. But again, if you have problems with social networks, if you have problems with Google, if you have problems with YouTube, if you have problems with Facebook and what they're doing to people, I, I urge you again, look <laughs> at the names of the people who run these people. These, you know, oh, these, I know, uh, Mark. I know, Mark. <laughs> Sergey Brin. Uh. Zuckerberg, look at the woman. Look at the woman who runs YouTube. But, but the, <laughs> one of them. But the thing is that this technology, though, you can't predict what, how it will be used and what direction it will be taken, and you also can't predict the effect that will it will have on society in advance. Um, it's not just a matter of um, you know this technology, like the phone or the airplane, is only going to be used for good and not evil. The, the technology has this kind of deep effect on the way that human beings live their lives and necessarily leads to this destruction of certain ways of life. So like birth control is an example. Birth control is something that, yeah, you, you, we, you, have, you introduce it into a society that is against fornication, is against adultery, is against degeneracy uh, uh, at large. Uh, yet that, that technology has this kind of ripple effect that leads to you know sexual revolution that leads to women in the workplace that leads to all these bad results that you could not have predicted in advance even though there was no intention to use birth control to promote um fornication or any any of these things or like the birth control pill for example so this is the danger of technology and obviously this is not my argument this is a, a very common argument that's made against uh, technological innovation and the capitalistic engine that drives it through research and development and usurious loans and investments and uh, that's the nature of capitalism but i think that you're against all of this yeah of course and i've got to say with things like the birth control pill with things like abortion a lot of what this does is it removes consequence from action and i'm sure as a religious man you acknowledge that actions have consequences and the consequences of any action should weigh on the mind of the individual before they commit to that action. But if you remove all consequence from action, you create people who just do what they will at any time to pursue pleasure because you've removed consequence. So at one point, if a young woman and a young man were to lay with each other and were to have sexual relations, they would understand there was a consequence to that. The consequence was that there was a child and society would look in on those people and say, if you do this and it results in a child, you two must come together, form a partnership and bring up that child properly and social pressure would push them together but what has happened is the powers that be have removed consequence from action and the result of removing consequence from action is madness because then people can do whatever they want without ever suffering consequence so then those people simply become like animals and pursue endless pleasure knowing that there can never be a consequence to that pleasure no, that I is agree. bad for our people. And it takes our people away then from morality, religion, family, all of the things that you rightly put on a pedestal. Yeah, I mean, this like utilitarian is, uh, utilitarianism, John Stuart Mill, this is exactly the philosophy of putting primacy on bodily pleasures and using science and technology to create new means to increase pleasure and reduce pain or um, duties or, and burdens that human life is is all about. So I would place that also at the beginning of uh, the Enlightenment within um, uh, Britain and France. But, uh, you know, I just want to open up the discussion. So I, I would want to ask you if there's anything difficult that you want to discuss. We have a lot of common ground, things to clarify about Islam, something that you disagree with Islam about. Uh, you mentioned veiling, for example, women veiling. This is something that is uh, prob like it offends maybe your sensibilities or the sensibilities of other whites. But I find that an ironic position because uh, I don't know if you've seen this footage of factory workers within London 
at the turn of the 20th century. It's a, it's a very old like footage that shows uh, English women covering their face. Like they have uh, shawls over their hair. You can't see their hair and they're actually covering their face uh, in public as, as they're walking. This is something that you find uh, within uh, European history um, in many cultures, not just European culture. So <laughs> British heritage or English heritage actually includes veiling and covering of the face of women in, in public. It's, it's a modesty issue. It's something that civilized people do. And unfortunately, that has been taken away um, uh, because of liberalism. But anyway, if you want to respond to that or if you have... No, any... I think there are differences between Islam and the West. I think Western values, if you look at Western art, if you look at architecture, if you look at sculpture, um, in the West, we have always deified the female form. Now, that is not so in Islam. And that's a difference. And that's a cultural difference. Now, I'm not saying your way is wrong. And I'm not saying our way is right for you. Your way is right for you. Our way is right for us. And I... You know, it's a mutual respect, really. And that's where I, how I really want to build a bridge with you, because I am not a cultural supremacist. I'm not a white supremacist. I don't want to be supreme over anyone. I mean, we all nominally sort of believe that we are right in what we do. And we look towards the things that we enjoy or the things that we subscribe to sort of as the best as you naturally would. But that doesn't mean you can't respect others. And I don't believe anyone should be supreme over anybody else. I think the point is that where there are differences, peaceful separation is better than being forced into the same uh, small area. And often cultural conflicts then arise. So, for example, I am absolutely happy for Muslim women to be veiled in Muslim countries. I'm absolutely happy for uh, the call from prayer towers to go out at 6 a.m. or whatever time of the day or night in Muslim countries. You know, I'm happy for mosques to dominate the skyline in Muslim countries. But here in the UK, I like the sound of church bells and I like, you know, the cathedral to dominate the skyline. That doesn't mean I hate mosques. It doesn't mean I hate Muslim women. It doesn't mean I hate Muslim prayer. It just means I believe that the place for those things is not here. And in the same way, if a group of people decided to go to a Muslim nation, started demanding that churches were put up or walking down the street in sort of uh, cut off shorts, showing their bum cheeks, and you guys said, no, 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 you're going to jail for doing this. I would say absolutely those people deserve to go to jail because they were forcing something upon you that was not for you. Yeah, so in the future, like you, you might not prefer to see these kinds of uh, mosques in the skyline or the call to prayer. But is it possible, conceivable, that? Oh, by the way, I just want to make a point here because people in the chat are saying about headscarves. I don't have any problem with people wearing like a headscarf. What I have a problem with is the full face veil, where they completely cover their face and you can only see their eyes. That's what I'm talking about when I say the veil. Yeah, but that, that was practiced within European history. As I, you can see the footage yourself. It's historical footage. Okay, but as they I bring said... It a, they, it's not like the actual, like, it's not hands-free, so to speak. They actually were bringing, the English women bringing the shawl over their face. And even in the depictions, that's the, that's the way that women use shawls historically. So even in depictions of the Virgin Mary, you'll see that she's wearing hijab, basically. She's, wearing, she's covering her hair. Uh, but it wasn't um, that women like the Virgin Mary herself were going out with their faces exposed. That's, that's the most beautiful part of a woman <laughs> is, is her face. Actually, the shawl is used to uh, shield the face from the gaze of strange men. I, I would argue that's a part of Christian modesty norms and European. If you go far back, back far enough, it's also a part of uh, European history as well. Um, there was another point that I wanted to make. Yeah, in the future, imagine Islam somehow as a, without immigration uh, in the in the future Christian ethno-nationalist state. You have Islam somehow spreads. It's just compelling to um, Britons or, or Europeans at that time. And in the future, um, Islam becomes the majority religion 
even though it's a white ethno state. And then, you know, those individuals will not have a problem seeing mosques and the No, again, no. Well, if that was to happen, if that was to happen, and that was that that was a natural spread, that would be something that that would be nature taking its course and you would have to concede that. What I am my issue with multiculturalism and this is the key to what I've said all along today is the multiculturalism that we are seeing the mass immigration we are seeing is not a natural phenomenon it is completely state endorsed establishment controlled and it has been something that has been driven at an, a natural level i mean i can give you you know I've, I've given the facts on this before and largely it's also driven as i said by these zionist led wars in the middle east which again are not a natural occurrence so what i'm not i'm not arguing about theoretical natural spreads of um, theology in the future. What I'm arguing against is uh, forced forms of multiculturalism that come about from what I believe to be this undue Zionist influence. Yeah, so you don't have, you know, you don't see ethno-nationalism being contradictory to Islam. It's just this is the heritage that you are familiar with, the heritage that you want to preserve because of you know, your personal experience um, does not include Islam, but that's not a principled objection that you have to Islam as a religion. You could very well s imagine a uh, Islamic Britain in the future, as long as it's happening organically, you know, people are accepting it uh, based on how compelling it is. That's something that you don't have a problem with. Yeah, essentially, yes. And I do also think, I know that... Um, different different groups of christians express themselves slightly different so there's you know there's the russian orthodoxy there are um there's the church of england there's the greek orthodoxy and there are small differences between interpretations of the same religion so catholics and protestants have different interpretations sunni and shia muslims have different interpretations and that also makes up part of the ethno state so for example i would expect um greeks and the Greek Orthodoxy to have a slightly different expression of their religion to the Russian Orthodoxy or to those who follow the Church of England or those who are um, Catholics. Now, it's the same with any religion. I would expect Sunnis and Shiites to have a different interpretation of that religion. And that also makes up part of what the ethno state is. Ethno states are quite complex things that take into account more than just race. They take into account ethnicity, which is also uh, culture, it's tradition, it's something that is deeper than just race. So race is people of European descent, but not all people of European descent are identical. You know, language is a component of the ethno state. There's lots of things. It's a complex thing. It's something that would be very difficult to absolutely unpack and to quantify in sort of a two hour you know, YouTube discussion. Um, but yeah, if there was a natural change amongst people that happened organically, I don't think anything can stop that. But what I'm saying is all of the changes we're seeing now that we're both railing against are not organic. They are led by the mainstream media and by the group that I've mentioned before. And that is something very, very different to organic theological changes within populations. Yeah, I mean, we have problem with what is happening in the world today, even though we disagree on the ultimate source of that. Um, but that's something that can be discussed uh, in a very, you know, rational, calm way. Um, yeah, so the, the thing about... Um, a future Muslim Europe. That's something that I don't know if all nat white nationalists would agree with, but it's very interesting hearing your perspective on that. But when it comes to multiculturalism, uh, did you agree with the point that if you have different cultures, they can come together under one religion and that not be a conflict that would that would not be it's only in the situation where you have no religion you've secularized and you're bringing all of these people from different cultures who have no common ground that can create uh, conflict and chaos i i agree with that but if there's a unifying religion if there's a unifying belief in god 
do you think that that can work or do you think that still would necessarily wind into conflict? I think often you have different groups that take on the same religion, but the expression of that religion is slightly different because of the groups in question. So, for example, if Christianity was introduced to sub-Saharan Africans, I think they would have a very different expression of Christianity than, say, Europeans, in the same way that if Christianity was introduced to people in the Far East, they would have a different expression of Christianity than either Europeans or sub-Saharan Africans. So I do think there is a racial and cultural um, tint to any religion. So, for example, here in the West, we... Um, celebrate Christmas and many of the many of the traditions of Christmas are actually not rooted completely within Christianity but are part of a merging of our ancient pagan cultures and pagan traditions and modern Christianity which was then imported to the west so that tells you that if Christianity had taken root elsewhere it wouldn't have developed in exactly the same way due to the difference between people and the cultures that came before the religion that then goes on to become dominant. So had Christianity first gone to the Far East, it is doubtful that we would have seen Christmas trees because Christmas trees were part of um, basically a pagan, a pagan belief. It, it was something that was rooted in pre-Christianity. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, but isn't with maybe Christianity, there's not enough similarity between these different groups, like Coptic Christians, for example, or Christians in Latin America versus the ones in, in Europe. Uh, but that might be because of Christianity as a, as a religion. Um, but I don't see how those kinds of cultural differences are something that couldn't be overcome. Um, on the basis of shared brotherhood, because my understanding of Christianity is that that's universalist. It's not ethno-nationalist, actually. Uh, well, no, no. What I'm saying is there are differences between Sunni and Shia Muslims. Is that correct? Yes. And sometimes they war against each other, despite the, the fact that they both serve Allah, they both believe in the Prophet Muhammad, and they both would claim to be devout Muslims. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. And it's the same within Christianity, that there are different interpretations of the Bible and there are different expressions of Christianity that sometimes lead to conflict amongst Christians. So there is obviously the well-known clash between Catholics and Protestants in Ireland and Northern Ireland. And I think that's when you start to take into account the complex nature of ethnicity which is more than just race, it's more than just religion, it takes into account multiple different factors and creates ethnic groups which are defined across multiple lines and then sometimes there are conflicts so the you know a Coptic Christian might not agree with somebody who's part of the Russian Orthodoxy in the same way as a Shiite might not agree with a Sunni and I do believe that Shiites and Sunnis have had um, sizable conflicts in the past yet both if you set them both down and said how much do you love your god how much do you believe in muhammad they would both no, the um, difference between that they did the difference between sunnis and shis are shiites as you say they're they're uh theological they're not cultural so you have they in fact they share the same culture uh arab culture or countries like in syria like in lebanon like in uh, iran even they are the same culture but their the conflict is on the basis of theology uh, so that that's not a counter example to but there my are, point. The, there is again. There, I would say there's sometimes a little bit of an overlap there. So you would say that the Catholics and the Protestants, they would say that their differences were theological primarily. But when you look at their expression of Christianity, there are cultural differences too. So those cultural differences cannot be overcome because of, you know, shared. Protestantism but, but I'm saying that there's more than just, for me, there's more than just theological differences between Catholics and Protestants. There's, there's, there's differences between tradition. Yeah, you can find differences between any given person, any given group. There's always going to be differences. Hmm. But the question is, um, how 
different can people be and still come together in a cohesive and unified way. And I think that as long as there is a very strong glue, a unifying force in the form of a very compelling uh, theology, a very compelling um, history of preservation of the religion, this is what we find in Islam, that, has, that is strong enough glue to bring people who are very different in, in many different ways, whether it be culturally, ethnically, uh, racially, culturally, so forth, to still come together and, and form a very you know, strong uh, community and nation, civilization, um, that's even from the beginning of Islam, it was very culturally diverse. Um, you had not just Arabs uh, in the Arabian Peninsula at the beginning of Islam. You had uh, Persians, you had um, Christians, there were Jews as well. You had all kinds of different ethnicities and races that were able to come together and unite, which united the Arabian Peninsula and eventually led to the expansion and spread of Islam. Uh, absorbing even more cultures, even more ethnicities and races. So it's the it's the religious belief that's able to accomplish that, uh, despite vast differences in culture and race. I think things like that happen on a case by case basis, and sometimes people can overcome differences and come together, and sometimes people can't. And obviously, the more similar you are to another set, to another group of people, the more likely you are to overcome differences. So, I'll give you an example of how I would base or how I would uh, talk about things from my perspective. I would say that small amounts of immigration from a country like Sweden, of indigenous Swedes, into um, the UK would cause less upheaval than immigration from sub-Saharan Africa because there are more similarities between uh, indigenous Brits and indigenous Swedes than there are between indigenous Brits and people from say Somalia. So I think the more similar you are obviously the more likely you are to get along and that seems like a very simple thing when you boil it down to such a, a basic and uh, one-line answer but that's ultimately what it does come down to. The more similar you are, the less likely you are to fall out. So essentially, but even... But there's benefits. There are benefits to being with people that are different from you, um, that are coming from a different context, a different mentality, a different culture. There are benefits. Uh, that's what actually, I, I, I know it's cliche to say diversity is our strength, but for Muslims, that literally was the case. Diversity, arguably, it was the diversity of Muslims uh, from different cultures, different backgrounds coming together under one ummah or one nation that gave Muslims a lot of strength and ability to uh, spread um, and, and become one of the most powerful and dominant civilizations in, in world history. But there were many unifying factors as well. I mean, obviously, we're not going to agree on everything. And I think mm -hmm. we've agreed on a lot. I don't know how you intend to carry this on. obviously we've been going for two hours do you read yeah. out the super chat soon or uh yeah we, go we can questions? we can we can go to questions because obviously uh, if, we, if you have i any. should imagine i've seen you've had quite a few super chats so obviously um if you know originally we said we we're going to sort of do two to three hours i just didn't want this to end up going yeah, on yeah we can we can wind things down um i think that we i think we've agreed on most we agreed things on most and, things we agreed yeah, on i think criticism it's been good. Of, i've enjoyed it yeah i've enjoyed it as well we we agreed on uh, liberalism and the enlightenment we agreed even on technology <laughs> we agreed that all the, there is this ultimate problem of degeneracy and liberalization we disagree on the cause of that and the origins of that yeah um so we agree on quite a bit actually much more than i expected so let me just uh find i'm happy about that as well i didn't come here to make enemies i came here to make friends i yeah. can assure you of that i came here in good faith because I wanted to reach out to your audience because I don't want your audience fighting with my audience and I don't want our people at each other's throats. I don't want white Christians and Muslims killing each other to further the aims and objectives of another group that I'm not gonna mention. <laughs> I want us to shake hands, acknowledge our differences, acknowledge our, our commonalities and peacefully separate for the good of both of our groups. And I want both of our groups to prosper. I came here in good faith to say that because I think you've got a sizable following and I don't want your following to be my enemy. Well, thank you for that, uh, Mark. 
I appreciate it. I invited you in good faith as well. Um, and I wanted to have a productive discussion because I think that you're reasonable and you can, you know, follow an argument and respond and, and share your perspective in a reasonable and uh, coherent fashion. So let me just read some of these super chats. Uh, Tahseen Bake says the Muslim populations in the West and standard of living in the West is only better due to the colonialism that happened in the past. What is the moving forward plan in his point of view? So I guess this is directed to, to you, Mark. I think the standard of living in the West is a product of the hard work of people who lived in the West. And when people talk about colonialism, when people talk about slavery, I've done large um, presentations on that before. Huge numbers of white people lived in absolutely the worst conditions under capitalism. Colonialism is a result of capitalism. Capitalism is something that I find absolutely disgusting. I know that many Muslims absolutely abhor and fight against usury and they fight against global capitalism which is something else white nationalists fight against it's something else we would have commonality we don't believe that a globalized banking system serves our people colonialism land grabs etc were not a product of white people were a product of global capitalism and again i would ask you politely to look into who owns your banks and who are the people behind the global capitalist system yeah, I think that the um, colonial question goes back to the whole con uh, technology question that uh, if white ethno states were to be created tomorrow, um, there would be such a huge power discrepancy that this would threaten um, the rest of the world as, as it did, you know, with uh, the scientific revolution. I can tell you now, my, I can tell you now, my friend, if I was in charge of the UK tomorrow, and I was in complete control as if I was, you know, um, a dictator or an emperor or something like that. You have my word on my life. I would not be bombing or brutalizing any Muslim countries. You would never, ever see British troops jumping out of planes, landing boats on your shores, driving tanks across your plains or bombing or destroying your towns and cities. I have well, no desire right. for any conflicts with you. Yeah, you, I think that you've made that clear, but the question is the historical nature. I don't want to say, call it reparations, but there's, you admit that there is a great deal of wealth that the West has been able to achieve because of colonialism. Like you can't think that only whites are the ones who, and Europeans who have worked hard and the rest of the world is at such a lower level of I GDP believe... per capita because other people don't work hard. No, I don't believe it's a matter of working hard. I don't believe you. I don't believe you're lazy people. I'm not saying you're lazy people. Different mm -hmm. people develop in different ways. That's one of the beauties of the world. Um, it's not about. That's what I'm saying. It's not about supremacism. You see, certain people. There are certain tribes out there in the world today who have never developed technology and have lived off the land in within a circle of nature and some people might look at those people and look down their noses at them and say and think and feel superior to them because they live in a house with you know a large flat screen tv and they've got two cars on the drive etc and they're surrounded by technology and they clothe themselves in all kinds of finery i don't actually see the world like that i see different tribes who have achieved different levels of technological advancement as ultimately the masters of their own destiny. I don't look down on those people. They have their place in the world. And if that is where they are, and it, they are as a people happy with that, living in contentment, that is up to them. I'm not saying I look down on anyone. Yeah, so it's a matter of addressing the historical, what has happened in the past um, and what it, what kind of responsibility there is for that, so. Let me see. I'm not seeing any questions in the super chats. So one person says, Mark, some Muslims would argue that you'd still have a big foot in liberalism 
if you don't criminalize liberal values like LGBT, blasphemy, social, sh social shame would not be sufficient? Social shame was always sufficient in the West. However, I do believe certain things do need to be criminalized and certain things do absolutely need to be, uh, for want of a better term, pushed back in the closet. I'll give you an example. If you look at what happens at some of these uh, LGBT pride parades, you have naked men walking down the street performing sex acts on other naked men in full view of the public, often in the full view of children that liberal parents take to these horrible events. Now, I would say that we can all agree that we don't want those kind of grotesque acts taking place openly on our streets. I have um, published pictures of men performing sex acts on men at these events in front of children and said to people, this is child abuse. And I believe that people doing that should be prosecuted as child abusers and parents who take their children to sexu sexually explicit um, gatherings or events should also be looked into by social services because that is child abuse. So yes, certain things should be criminalized. I'm absolutely in agreement with you. You know, if you are, um, if you are an adult, whatever your sexual persuasion, and you are performing sex acts in front of children, you should be in jail. It's as simple as that. Well, I think um, sodomy was criminalized uh, throughout the Western world until very recently, like only the past 20 years, um, in, in America at least. You have states that criminalized same-sex acts, uh, specifically sodomy, uh, within Texas, for example, and other states, uh, as far uh, like since up until 2001, so that is actually criminalization of uh, unnatural sex acts has has been a feature of Western history, which is makes it so ironic when some of these liberals um, or even liberal white nationalists will criticize Islam for the hudud, you know, the, the um, uh, physical punishments, the uh, corporal punishments that we have uh, because of uh, wanting to regulate and criminalize degeneracy. Yeah, I don't criticize you for that. In fact, I have seen people who call themselves British nationalists who have criticized um, Iranians, who have criticized other Islamic nations for essentially... Um, stoning child abusers uh, to death. I don't believe that child abusers should have any rights and I also don't believe anyone in Britain should be legislating for what anyone in Iran does. <laughs> it's as simple as that. That is, that is up to those guys and I personally, as an individual, think that if any adult is abusing a child, that adult should face ultimately the death penalty. So I, I agree with that. Okay. Um, I don't, I'm not going to ask that question uh, involving uh, certain historical events. In oh, yeah. You don't want me telling my, uh, my opinions on that because <laughs> your channel will get banned. Yeah. Uh, I think this is just a comment. Uh, historically, cultures have always mixed to a certain extent. The question relies on what level of mixing is too much. We all deserve to preserve our cultures and beliefs within reasonable and respectable boundaries, I believe. Thank you for the super chat and the comment. Uh, let's see. Uh, here's a question for me. So, Daniel, do you agree with Mark's opinion of banning immigration? So... Anyone who is familiar with my channel knows that I'm constantly railing against the um, what is the cesspool uh, that the West has become, and um, whether it's Europe or America, and that actually has discouraged people from Muslims from coming to the West. Uh, Muslims who ask me, Muslims in um, Egypt, for example, or Iran, or other parts of the Muslim world, should I come to the West? And I tell them, no, if you want to preserve your religion, you want to preserve the religion of your children, don't come to this liberal, secular cesspool, this wasteland. 
And just last week, I did an interview with a uh, Muslim in Sweden. He's uh, originally uh, in Syria. He was in Syria. And the Swedish government actually encouraged uh, many Syrians um, to come as refugees to Sweden. So he brought his family, his wife and kids to Sweden and quickly realized that this was a major mistake because the liberal Swedish state um, has this draconian uh, policy of monitoring uh, basically all families, not just Muslim families, also non-Muslim families to make sure that um, they are teaching certain kinds of liberal values and making sure that children are properly indoctrinated basically. And it's led to a crisis of their child protective services, what's called social, uh, taking children, um, arguably disproportionately Muslim children from their parents on ridiculous things like, oh, the, the parents are saying that homosexuality is wrong, that fornication is wrong, uh, this is abuse, this is child abuse. So they're taking uh, these children. And so the whole Muslim community there with young children is living in fear such that many of them are going back to Syria. They're going back to this you know, war zone. And this uh, Muslim brother that I interviewed is saying that, yeah, I sent my, I took my children back to Syria. Uh, and when we landed uh, at the airport in Syria, I, you know, prostrated, I made sajda, I prostrated, thanking God that we're out of that uh, nightmare that we were in, in Sweden. And um, yeah, that's that was his, his story. It was a very moving and uh, shocking story because unfortunately this image is portrayed of the liberal West being a bastion of uh, all of these um, values of, uh, and prosperity. But um, the true picture is very, very uh, grim in comparison. Uh, but I also want to say that... Um, yeah, most Muslims would not want to come to the West if it weren't for uh, that being their only choice, whether they're choosing death or near death or living, you know, not at subsistence, subsistence levels of um, life. That's why they're coming to these countries, not because they think that, um, you know, this is a paradise. It's they have no choice. So I can definitely understand why they do it, even though I try to discourage it myself. Myself, I was born here, by the way, just as a background. I was born, my parents came here. I'd say it was for economic reasons. Uh, but yeah, that's my situation. I've sent you a super chat um, that I thought was quite interesting from uh, Khalid. Uh, the UAE 2020? Yeah. Your government allows immigrants to flow into Europe. So why do you blame immigrants? It's your government that you should blame for letting them in. I think you have done that. Yeah, I, I want to make this also very clear. I don't actually blame uh, Muslims or any other immigrant groups that come to the West. I believe uh, mass immigration is something that has been completely created and stage managed by the globalists. And it has been driven largely from the Middle East because of Zionist wars. I do not blame migrants who come here. I do not hate migrants who come here. I do not wish ill on migrants who come here. I simply want to end immigration and I want to do that by wresting power from the hands of people in my government. I see the greatest threat to my people uh, the, to be government and the government is part of this illusory political divide. And we talked earlier about democracy not working. Well, I've made videos on how democracy doesn't work and how a two party system presents the illusion of choice without actually giving people a genuine choice. So I do not hate uh, immigrants. and I do not blame immigrants wanting to come to the West. OK, thank you, Mark. One final question from the super chat. Why doesn't Mark look into Islam as potentially the truth for him? Islam solves all the problems that he lists and has a legal system. If you can prove that Islam is true, what stops him from accepting it? I am a Christian. Um, I'm not Muslim. I was brought up Christian. I was educated that way. Those were the hymns that we sang in school. Those were the lessons that we were taught in our assemblies and that means something to me that is part of my culture that's part of my heritage that is part of my tradition i 
think that Christianity has shaped the West in a certain way, as I've said, the West also shaped Christianity. And I think that's something in me, in the same way that I think Muslims find that there is something in Islam for them. And that's, that's a deeply personal uh, choice. However, and for some people, they would say it wasn't a choice, that it was something that was just within them, that they didn't actually choose it, that God chose them. Now, one thing I'll say about this is I would be happy to read the Quran and I'm always happy to go into things with an open mind. But I don't read many books. I'm actually somebody who's usually very, very busy. And the amount of time I have for reading isn't uh, isn't great. But despite not being a Muslim, as I've said many times during this last sort of two and a half, pushing two and a half hours, I am not um, against Islam and I do believe Islam as a place in the world. And I want to make a point because a lot of people keep conflating me with, say, Tommy Robinson or the um, anti-jihad movement or Anne-Marie Waters. Tommy Robinson, Anne-Marie Waters and the anti-jihad movement hate me as much as they hate you. <laughs> they hate me. They despise me. I am blacklisted from their events. They've made documentaries about how much they hate me. Tommy Robinson made an entire documentary called How to Burn a Nazi, where he attacked me and basically told all of his supporters not to listen to me. I am not in that camp. <laughs> Those people do not like me. They disavow ethnic nationalism. They stand for liberalism. They stand in many ways. People like Amory Waters, she is in fact a lesbian. She stands for LGBT rights. I do not stand for those things. That is not ethno-nationalism. And those people would not even regard themselves or uh, describe themselves as ethno-nationalists. So there's a huge um, difference there. And I've got to also say this, um, Tommy Robinson, Amory Waters and the anti-jihad movement, the people who demonize you for being Muslims are all big supporters of Zionism. Tommy Robinson is a massive supporter of Zionism. Anne-Marie Waters, her political movement used to have a whole section in its manifesto about her support for the state of Israel. And Jihad Watch, the group that um, people are talking about in the chat or have talked about in the chat, they are run by um, Pamela Geller, who is Jewish. She lives in America and they are funded by a group called the Middle East Forum, which is a Zionist led forum that funds people like Tommy Robinson, Anne-Marie Waters and other parts of that particular group. But that is not me. And I want to make that very, very clear. And if you look at the people behind all of this, um, Ezra Levant, he's another key player in that, the guy who runs Rebel Media. He's Canadian, but he's also Jewish. Uh, they have a commonality, and that is the support for the state of Israel and Zionism. Okay. Um, so if you want to make any closing remarks, and then I'll make a very brief closing remark as well, Mark, just okay. to wrap it I up. Just want to say, I just want to say, look, this has been a great, you know, we're, we're pushing two and a half hours. I want to say this is absolutely been fantastic i came here in good faith i believe it's been a great debate i believe that we have found much much common ground and i believe conversations like this should happen more often most crucially because conversations like this help us to understand differences as well as helping us to understand things that we have in common and the more we understand our differences and the more we understand the things we have in common, the less likely it is that we will come in to conflict with one another. Because I believe ethnic conflict is a terrible thing. I believe that violence, ethnic conflict, ethnic cleansing and supremacism are all negatives in this world. I'm an ethno-nationalist. I stand for peace, peaceful separation. I stand for people being controlled by themselves, taking their destiny into their own hands, not being controlled by globalists or Zionists or outside forces. And I believe that if we understand each other, we are less likely to do harm to each other, but also we are more likely to come together and combat groups that oppress both of our causes that are enemies to us both. And if we do that, we are more likely to be successful because I do believe there are powerful groups in this world who are an enemy to both of us. And I believe those powerful groups have spent much time 
pushing us into the same areas, turning us against each other and having us fight each other endlessly for their benefit. I do not want to see that. I do not want to see the Middle East bombed. I do not want to see the West taken over by uh, mass immigration, which is in part largely caused by these Middle Eastern wars. I do not want to see the genocide of Palestinian people, but nor do I want to see white genocide, nor do I want to see white people bred out in their ancestral homelands. In that way, I suppose I do stand for human rights, but I stand for my human rights as much as I stand for yours. And I think we both stand against globalization and the corrosive poison it drips into our respective people. We call it liberalism, but it can also be called feminism. It can also be called the LBG, LGBT agenda. It can also be called social media. It can be called the mainstream media. All of these things harm both our people. And if we understand that and we work against those ills rather than working against each other, I think we will be far more successful. And I think today has been a great success because it has helped us understand both our differences and our commonalities. And that is, of course, a great thing. So thank you so much for inviting me, Daniel. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, just wanted to say that we had a lot of commonality. Um, of course, I don't agree with um, ethno-nationalism in the sense that I believe that people can be united under religion. I think that Islam is the best system for that as, a, as a, the religion of God. As a Muslim, you know, I think if you read the chat, people are saying things like, we want Mark to become Muslim, they're inviting you to Islam, I'm inviting you to Islam as well, and you've already shown your openness to that. And, you know, there, as I said, um, I love white people in that some of the best Muslims today and in history have been white, um, European as well, European uh, descent. And so we don't judge people as Muslims on the basis of um, racial background or ethnicity. It's on the basis of values. And we can ally with people who have shared values, even if they don't accept Islam, even if they don't, ultimately they don't uh, accept Islam, we can still appreciate others for the values uh, that they have and the values that we share, you know, these fundamental human values that we all have. And we can all agree that liberalism and this kind of behemoth that has been unleashed, this is a negative that has to be opposed. I would argue that Islam is uh, uh, the best opposition or the last man standing in the opposition to uh, this kind of uh, reform, this liberal reform. I was surprised by, uh, Mark, your statements about your belief in theocracy, your belief in um, limiting technology or real actual limits on technology. So th I think that's a lot of common ground. Again, thank you very much uh, for taking the time. I hope everyone benefited from this informal debate. Can I make debate. one final point, Daniel? Absolutely, I absolutely. I, it's not really a point, but it is important. We've had over 2,000 people watching live at peak, and I've got this little app that restores the YouTube dislike so I can see the like to dislike ratio. This video has had over 1,700 likes and only three dislikes, wow. just three. That tells you how much both people who support myself and people who are Muslims, your brothers, sup and support you and what you do have liked what we've done today. So when people, and people will categorize this chat as hate but it's not if you look at that like to dislike ratio and it's just jumped up since i've been saying this to 1800 likes and three dislikes this chat has been about finding you know common ground understanding one another and if anything it has been about love and not hate and i urge you all please do take a copy of this debate because if youtube take it down i wouldn't like to see it being lost because I think it's very important. And that ratio has just increased again to 1,900 likes to just three dislikes. So I think, Daniel, you have made a lot of people very happy today by hosting this. And that is a wonderful, wonderful thing. So from the bottom of my heart and from all of the people who support me, thank you for doing this, Daniel. It's very much appreciated. Yes, thank you again, Mark. Appreciate the time. If this video gets taken down, I have backed it up. It will be on Odyssey, um, so people can access it on my channel there. 
so hopefully it will be preserved but with youtube you know like it's uh, you never know when the ban hammer is going to come down thank you so much mark uh, i hope you have a good rest of your evening Thank you so much. I'm going to leave now. But before I do, I'll just say the likes are now over 2000. So we have done some good work today, my friend. Thank you. Have a good evening yourself. And I'll see you all again. Good night, everybody. Good night. Take care.